my truck. The wind is jumping. You better stop flying about. Well, you can't hear me. <laughs> and then that's the train. The wind, the wind, that's right. There's a lot of trains here. But uh, always nice to see everybody come out for this campaign. The good news is we can actually win this race. It's, the primary season is very long. I, can't remember when. I think it started in 1962. But, uh, it's, we're getting to the last chapter. Uh, there's uh, just, I think it's 36 days, I think, to Election Day, someone told me. Is that right? 36 days. And, of course, ballots come out next week. So you can actually start to vote next week. So after all the tremendous amount of effort, we're finally in the home stretch, the last lap. What do they call it? The red flag or the yellow flag? The last lap. I don't know about my race car now. Checker. Checker. No, so that means danger. Checker <laughs> flag means accident. We don't want to do that. Checker is final. Oh, checker is final. Okay, thank you. Checker. So it's checker flag. But look, the key is we all know what's going on in the country. We've taken a turn in the wrong direction on every issue. We could run down all the issues that we all feel passionate about, whether it's gun safety or reproductive rights or immigration or health care or, you know, go on and on and on. And if you don't have enough issues, read the paper tomorrow, turn on the TV, you'll have another one. I'm sure it'll invent a new one. A lot of these crises that we're facing are, are manufactured. The president wants to make sure he's always in the spotlight so he makes up crises. And, you know, remember that horde, that big, uh, big horde, uh, horde of uh, Mexicans that were coming across the border? Uh -huh, yeah. Yeah, we're still waiting for it. You know, that was another chance when he had dominated the news for two days. But look, you all know I'm running for Congress because we need to have a voice for the progressive values that the country is really based on. Sometimes I've mentioned about my family. Some of you here may not know, but there's another way to look at my family, why inclusiveness is so important to me. I don't know if you know this. But, um, you know, my son got married two years ago. Our son got married two years ago. No. And, well, almost, almost going on two years. So going on two years. And um, he married a girl who's a Cuban-American. And he asked me to preside over the wedding. So, um, I was, I was honored to be asked, you know, in California, you can have anybody do a wedding ceremony, to go down and appoint somebody. So I said, that's great. And I started to think, you know, what am I actually going to say? I have to do something. I have to say something intelligent, which is a real challenge. <laughs> so I looked at Karen and I sat down and we looked at our family. And Karen, of course, is almost the United Nations in herself. Uh, she's part Chinese, she's part, part, Chinese part uh, Cherokee Indian, and you may have noticed Indian. part, part, uh, part African American. You may have <laughs> noticed that part. <laughs> and, you know, my, I'm from a mixed family. My, my uh, mother's family was Polish. Uh, my father's family was Scotch from Scotland. And you go on and on. So we looked at just the immediate family, and we found out that in the immediate family, there's 18 countries represented. 18 countries. Wow. So Karen got the idea the, to buy flags. So she went online hmm. and she bought 18 little flags of each of these countries. And then we had someone, you know, one of our uh, guys nearby, build a little stand. And we put all 18 flags in a stand, and we took it to the wedding. And as the end of the wedding, my final comments were to point out to the assembled guests that a wedding is more than just the union of two families. It very often is the coming together of multiple cultures. And as they walked to dinner, they would walk by the stand with these 18 flags. And so the whole idea of the United States being a welcoming society, an inclusive society, is very important to me personally. And it's important to all of us. It's just a matter of how many generations you want to go back to find your ancestors. Some of you have more recent immigrants than others. But we're all from the same background, that we're immigrants or grandsons or great-grandsons or great-granddaughters, whatever the case may be. And so this idea that we're going to insult Muslims and insult women and insult immigrants and go right on down the line of insults is really totally opposite to the values that I believe in, the values that the country is based on. And that really has to come first. We can talk about health care for all, which we absolutely have to move in the direction of Medicare for all. And I'm a big believer in that. I, have, I think I have enough experience to put it together in an intelligent fashion. I've been in the business for almost 20 years, and I think I know how health care works. But it all starts with being a welcoming, humane society that does not try to exclude people. And so when I get to Congress, I want to be that voice for progressive values that represent really the historical trend of this country. Now our trend, we look back at our history, it's never been a smooth curve. You know, it's Martin Luther King who said, you know, the arc of history bends towards justice. But it doesn't bend very quickly. And it doesn't bend in one straight line. It's back and forth, it's up and down. 
but here we are with all of these unfinished projects in this country, things that we've worked on, like civil rights for African Americans, like reproductive rights for women, environmental justice, better education funding. And before we had any of these projects done and completed, we get an administration that wants to push us back decades, not months, years. give enough free sandwiches away. Probably next time we need French fries and get a bigger crowd. That was our, probably our mistake. We need French fries to get people to be But uh, with your help, we can elect a truly progressive voice in Congress. And I thought, I was thinking about this the other day, and I said, you know, why should we settle for red to blue? And we can do red to progressive. We don't want to just go to a Democrat who's going to go in and say, yeah, I'm in favor of clean air, I'm in favor of clean water. We should get someone that's going to fight for the actual values on which the country is based. And that's the basis of my campaign, to really go in and have help the progressive movement in the United States, the progressive instinct in the United States, help that progressive instinct refine its voice. And by refining its voice and building allies on both sides of the aisle, you get some support from some Republicans on specific narrow issues. They, you won't get broad-based support, but on a particular issue, you'll find some Republicans might agree with you. But the job is to go in there and start the battle. And the battle has to start in 2018. We have to take back the House, hopefully take back the Senate, but we have to take back the House, and that's where the battle begins. So my goal is to go into Congress and be part of that fight, and take back the House, steer a ship of state in a different direction and go back to fundamental progressive values which means social and economic justice for everyone. So, thank you. You've probably heard that before. <laughs> that's our objective. It is. It is, yeah, it is our objective. We want to hear that one. That's what we want to hear. Yeah, and, uh, well, I appreciate it. My plug will be that, you know, that, that is ultimately what we're trying to do and it does come down to the work of volunteers like our lovely volunteers here who would otherwise be helping us canvas or phone bank or you know any other way to get the word out um, up until the from now until the election we're doing something pretty much every day um, I think today we have four different canvases going on three or four different canvases going on throughout the district so Don if you're interested in helping us um, we'd love to, to figure out something whatever works with your schedule but yeah that's uh, that's the goal of getting the word I out. I canvassed yesterday in full event. Yeah. And today yeah. there was another camp that just went in to say hello. And, uh, you know, reception is great. I mean, people are really ready for a change. They really are. I mean, there's a lot of enthusiasm, not only amongst Democrats, but a lot of moderate Republicans or the you know, independent voters who uh, look at the landscape and they say, it's time for change. We have a lot of people who say it's time for change. Yeah. Um, people that maybe never thought of themselves as Democrats and still don't identify as Democrats, but they think it's time for change. We just have to find those people, canvas, find them, identify them, make sure they're registered, and then make sure they can cast their ballot. Yeah. And they can cast their ballot starting next, uh, I think it's the 7th. The 7th. Yeah, the 7th. Monday the 7th. Monday the 7th, so that's yeah. a week from tomorrow. Yeah. 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 That's a week from tomorrow. Yeah. Week from tomorrow you can start to get your ballots. If you're if you're a mail if you're a mail in ballot, the ballot should arrive on the 7th, and then you can start to vote. So we have to identify those people and help get those ballots uh, delivered. Get them in the mail or pick them up and deliver them. So it's, uh, it's, it's time is now. Time is now. Good. Good that you keep on reminding us it is coming. It's coming. It's mm -hmm. now it's here. Yeah, now it's here. It's been a long, mm -hmm. been a long battle. Uh, how do you, how do you think you would be here on election? deal with Medicare? Would you sort of start lowering the age or include particular groups and over time? Or, or what do you think is a That's a good question. Good the way I would prefer to do it. I mean, obviously, it's going to take a huge consensus to do it. Right. But I think the best way to do Medicare for all is you start with a relatively limited set of benefits. You cover everybody. <laughs> but you don't make it too comprehensive at first. And that gradually, over time, you increase the benefits that are there. Uh, increase the coverage. Increase the coverage. Slowly. Okay. Increase the coverage. Slowly. <laughs> Okay, so then it keeps the it, it does keep, it keeps the finances on the keeps the finances sound and it also gives the insurance industry a chance to adjust. Okay. But you don't want to go into a Medicare for all and all of a sudden you have a million people on a point. So at the end of the process you'll still have a supplemental tier of benefits that people will buy from private insurance companies as they do in Europe. But you want to get there by figuring what is the essential benefits we really need to cover mm -hmm. on a you know public basis, Medicare for all basis. Okay. Preventive care patient care, and then you gradually expand it. And even if you go to Canada today, Canada still doesn't cover dental care, and they still don't cover um, eyeglasses. Yeah. So you 
gradually expand and expand, and eventually you have a really robust program. Okay. So that's the way I would prefer to do it. Uh -huh. But in reality, it's going to be a bunch of people sitting around a table. A lot of ideas are kicked around. But I would prefer it to be sort of a care act. Instead of that, I would prefer a modest Medicare for all plan that they could have expanded. Okay. But uh, the Affordable Care Act was a step in the right direction. I certainly support it. I'd like to see it fixed and then use that as the basis to go to uh, universal coverage. I don't believe that Affordable Care is the perfect basis because it really didn't address the critical issues which are the special interest prescription and health insurance industries which in practically increase the cost for everybody. I think it should be expanded to Medicare because Medicare has to a large extent eliminated the special interest. <laughs> well, Medicare would definitely be a better way to do it if you had the political feasibility to do that. The best way to do it is certainly to start phasing in Medicare for all. Politically, though, it's more likely that you're going to have to first shore up the Affordable Care Act and move from there. So I think it's a combination of what's per what's ideal and what's practical political. If, it was, if I was making this sole decision, I would definitely start with Medicare for all and bypass the Affordable Care Act. I don't know that that's going to be politically feasible, so you might have to start by saying, when we fix the Affordable Care Act, let's take out the provision that prevents Medicare from negotiating drug prices. Let's drive prescription prices down that way. Uh, and I, and, and, but if, you, if we could skip that step, I would certainly be in favor. Absolutely. But the support it kind of maybe over time build support for the Correct. sense Correct. that Medicare is the way to do this. I think so. You get yeah. more and more people to I think that's going to turn out to be more, you can yep. I think that's going to be more feasible politically. Even in the UK, where I, where I spent a lot of time, they say, I don't know if this is true, that the only way we're able to get Medicare for all done there, because of the war, after World War II, right. they were just desperate for new measures, and so mm. they, they got through um, a universal health care system. Right. So without a real genuine crisis, it might be hard to do, but it's, it's, that's what you got to work towards. Okay. you got to work towards it. Deal with the partner situation? Yeah. What, what co committees would you want to be on in the... Uh, yeah. in the House. Obviously, Royce, I don't think he used his voice on foreign relations, but he was, he was in foreign a considerable weight in foreign he relations, did. and he sometimes did. he did say things to moderate the Trump. He, no, he did. In foreign relations, he was a good guy. He, was, he yeah. wasn't a bad guy in foreign relations. That wasn't his weakness. I think the two things for me would be education and mm -hmm. whatever committee has jurisdiction over health care. Mm -hmm. Now, in the House, they changed the names of the committees, you know. Right. There used <laughs> to be a labor working. committee. Yeah. The Republicans didn't even like the idea that it was a committee called the Labor Committee. So they renamed it, so it doesn't have labor in it anymore. So, you know, so I'm not really sure what committee has jurisdiction over health care. I would like to be on that, and labor would, that would be my two first choices. Now, I have been told that it doesn't necessarily matter what your choices are when you're a rookie. Yeah. <laughs> it might be more like you have the office in the basement with no windows, right. and this is your committee assignment. But um, I think the area will, and you don't have to be on a committee to have an impact, you know, impact obviously. Anybody can show up and make suggestions and go to the hearings. Uh, but I think where I think I have the most expertise is education and medical and healthcare. Yeah. And I also have a lot of experience in um, financial regulation. But I mm -hmm. think they have a pretty strong caucus in favor of financial regulation in the House and Senate now. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Elizabeth Warren, going to the party, um, you know, needs more supporters and more allies. But they have mm -hmm. some pretty good expertise there. But okay. Those are the three areas where I have the most experience. Mm -hmm and where I could probably offer the most uh, useful legislative advice. Mm -hmm. Well, however it works out, you're gonna, if you get there, you're going to be among a huge crowd of freshmen Republicans on the order of 50 or 60 of them. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. So it's, it, a committee assignments will be well reflected. That is very, very true. It, it could be anywhere from 30 to 70 or 80. It could, it could be a huge number. There's another analysis out today um, I, I think it was in the New York Times, it might have been on 538 blog, I can't remember, that, uh, you know, 60, 60 is not unrealistic to shoot for. 60 is almost a given because there's 55 people leaving the house. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's a 55 yeah. minimum number. Now, some of them might be Republicans, but that's... <laughs> no, I'm yeah, I'm talking about in terms of rookie, uh, rookie Democrats. Mm -hmm. I mean, to the total rookie class, Republicans and Democrats, would be enormous. But the Republicans, the Democrats could take back as many as 50, 60, 70 seats. And that will mean that when the Democrats make the committee assignments, there'll be a lot of rookies lined up. And uh, then I'll tell them that they should do it by age, by seniority. <laughs>
I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that's my first motion. Yeah, right. uh, everything should be by seniority. Yeah. Yeah. Then yeah. I, maybe I get what I want. Chronologically. Yeah. Yeah, Are your, is your campaign participating in get out the vote efforts? Oh, the, I think yeah. the key to this yeah. is just getting Democrats to the polls. The Absolutely. Um, so I can speak on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, so uh, get out the vote week and weekend. We will be doing a lot of different reasons why we need volunteers to really have people driving um, other voters to the polls. Um, so people might not be able to get, them, get there themselves. Um, either they have transportation issues or elderly. So we really want to make sure that we, um, we get them out to the poll vote if they are registered to the poll vote. Um, another thing that we can do and that we will have volunteers coordinating as well is uh, getting ballots early. Um, so it's now legal in California to collect ballots and we turn them in. Uh, we're going to be helping people, you know, fill them out if needed and, and turn them in. Are you, so you're saying in California you can't pick up yeah. uh, yes. this year, voters' ballot? Yeah, this is the first, first year you can go. Oh, okay. Yeah, they have a new law. I know there are states where yeah. you can't do that. You're not allowed. You can't, you can't hear. You can pick up a ballot. Yeah, I'm yeah. Not, yeah you can't hear. Yeah, yeah and uh, I think voter literacy is also something that uh, that the field staff has been working on. Voter literacy. Uh -huh. um, there's a lot of, especially minority voters. Um, I'm working particularly with Latino outreach, um, and it's a matter of educating people how to a register to vote, how to turn in their mail in ballots. Um, that they might not be as familiar with and otherwise it's out on just by lack of information. It is the key though. I think this yeah. year turnout is the key. Yeah. Uh, particularly younger turnout. Uh, the younger, younger demographic has to turn out. Uh, students out. Mm -hmm. So it's a big part of everything we've done. Yeah, getting out the vote will be very, very important, especially in this system here in California is very different than me most places around the country. And uh, people are not understanding that we automatically get a Democratic candidate in the November election. This is a top two. You can get top two Democrats, you can get top two Republicans, you can get a Republican and a Democrat, uh, a Republican and an Independent, you can get a Democrat and an Independent. I won twice, going to be twice in a row. If I get twice as many votes as anybody else, if they put me on your list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> no. But it is important, and we have to really make sure that our point. people emphasize that when they're speaking to, especially new voters. Absolutely, um, and I think you know, voter literacy is an issue at every level. That's definitely part of it. And I, I personally have had a lot of really productive conversations with people canvassing who aren't familiar with the primary system and who would otherwise vote, they just don't know how or they don't understand the importance right. of the primary as compared to participating uh, in the yeah, federal election. I think that your mailers out to people, and uh, I can see that Joseph and Arrows are thrown out his bunch too, yeah. have really brought up uh, awareness. I think a lot more people are aware of what's going on among independents and, and Democrats. In the past, Republicans have had their own efforts, but they steered it towards Republicans and left everybody else out except by accident. And um, so I think we're raising our game up so that there will be a better turnout. I, th I think there will be. Everyone expects that there will be, partly because of the enthusiasm. I mean, people don't really do. If you go to any of the four, you can see how much enthusiasm yeah. there is. Even the early polls that get early in the primary, people are still turning out. Like this. So you can make any enthusiasm, but it's still, it's still hard. It's particularly the young kids. You know, I know when I was in college or just out of college, I planned to vote. And, you know, election day, anything gets, oh, I forgot, I was too busy, I did this, I had to do that. And you just got to stay on top of and get into the polls. And, uh, you know, some people are so motivated, they don't need a reminder. But when you're younger, a lot of people need when, a reminder. When you're younger, you know, there's a lot of pressures on their life. They're trying to maybe do exams, or get a job interview, and they completely forget about money. Yeah, and that's why those uh, volunteer reminders go a long way. Uh, yeah, yeah. 
complicated information. Eventually, it'll stick with people and helping them vote if they don't know how um, or register. All and there's of that a lot of really there's a lot of outside organizations working on registration from outside mm -hmm. the district. Even. A lot of community, they're actually sending people into the 39th to register voters. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some people from uh, the further south coming down yeah. to register. So there's been a lot of spontaneous uh, community organizations, you know, neighborhoods that used to just talk to each other. Now they're organized, they give themselves a name, and they come down and they canvas and they register people to vote. So it's, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of stuff going on. You just got to keep it up. Okay. Uh, do you know when the next general forum is with, among a lot of candidates? I don't think I there's one on the calendar now. There no were two more. last week. There isn't. There will be more, but there, uh, there, there is one. There will be one this upcoming month. I don't have the date for that yet, but uh, okay. I think I have your contact information. I can always reach out to you and let you know. Oh. Those, are, those are good to go, too. Okay. There is one scheduled, um, I think, next week from the Council on uh, American Islamic Religions. Huh. There, I believe, is next week. That's interesting. I think it's next door. I have to double check that. Interesting sponsor. <laughs> Interesting sponsor, right. Exactly. Yeah. I happen to be at another event and I happen to meet the, the uh, chairman of the, organ of the organization. Right. So he reminded me, and I think it is next week. Is yeah, it is next week. What, what day? Yeah, we'll yeah. check. Yeah, I, think, I thought it was next week. Yeah. And that, that would be that would be interesting to go to. Yeah, definitely. They're they're a, they're a terrific community. They're very engaged. They're very well informed. Are the Republicans going to come? I mean, they've been well, invited. they were invited. I don't know. Yeah. They've kind of been avoiding most of the you know forums. There's one Republican that's been showing up, but he's a kind of a French candidate, and he has a lot of following. The three main candidates only came to one forum. The others have just been. Uh, Boy, they have been invited, but they haven't been showing up. I don't know if they'll come to this one. Ed Royce was pretty popular in this community. So you know, can't like very well show up at this one. Because uh, I met a lot of the people at a event I went to, and they were, a lot of them were Ed Royce supporters uh, in the past. But now they want to go down there. Um, and so I, I wouldn't be surprised if young Kim shows up since she's supported by Ed Royce. And this was part of his um, his electoral base, included a lot of... Um, a lot Is of she running? Community. Yeah, young Kim is right now. Yeah, she's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. She and she might she showed up once in one of the four. And uh, make sure you get this on tape though. Make sure you get this. And she was appallingly uninformed. She was I was appalling how uninformed she was on the issues. The audience asked a few questions and most of her answers were some version of I worked with Congressman Royce for so many years and I'm here to carry on his work. And the, the question might have been, what are you going to do with immigration? <laughs> Her answer was always some version of, you know, I worked with Congressman Royce for a long time and I'm going to carry on his work. Oh. <laughs> how, that, how she got that uh, assembly seat. Uh, assembly yeah, seat. Yeah, yeah. That's how you got, she, she was in the assembly. Well, yeah. Basically, what she's saying is, I'll do whatever the House leader says. That, that's very mm -hmm. legitimate interpretation. Very legitimate interpretation. When, when, when is the thing? Um, I'm looking at it and it doesn't look like it's on the calendar yet. It is next week. But I'm sure there'll be so, emails. So. Yeah, there will be. So that one I know is scheduled, and there'll be a couple more after that. But that yeah. one I know is already on the calendar. Uh, so we'll, we'll let you know. Good. Who schedules that one? Uh, all right. Uh, they're scheduled by different organizations. So League of Women Voters sponsor some of them. I have not heard of any of those. But we Actually, have until I had a friend who went to one of those forums. He called me and said, Matthew, are you coming? I said, what? <laughs> I said, if there's a forum, all the candidates are here. I said, I am not aware of it. Mm -hmm. And I said, even if I come now, it will be too late. Mm -hmm. We'll have to put you, make sure you put, put Yeah, your, I can uh, definitely reach out to the list. Yeah, we'll put, we'll put, we always know that, obviously. We'll put you on the list and let you know. Yeah. 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 That's what we all on the web. It won't be that. It'll be, uh, yeah. No, it'd, be Skype, it'd be a Skype, a Skype form. We're going to Skype the next one. It'll right. be uh, perfect. One more substantive yeah. question. Yeah. I don't know if you know, there was a lot of discussion when the tax bill was going through that one of the provisions of the tax bill was to count tuition waivers given to graduate students as taxable income. It was dropped. That Good. did not go through. Good. That was, that was dropped. Okay. I wondered what had happened to it. Right. Uh, they were going to count that as, uh, as taxable yeah. income, but they, they, they dropped that. Okay. How do you think we could go about making college more affordable for students uh, for the future all of for future students. Yeah. Well I, I have supported and I, I and I hopefully get the Congress will support mm -hmm. 
taxpayer supported two year and four year tuition for all public universities. For all mm -hmm. two year and four year colleges, tuition should be paid by taxpayers, by the federal government. Uh -huh. As it used to be. As, as it used when to I be, kid, most of them, exactly. They were be. free. University of California was free. Right. Right. Cal right. State was free. And Rutgers was essentially free. I, I applied to UCs two years or three years ago now, and for me it would have cost $30,000 a year. Um, it actually ended up being more cost effective for me to go to a private school where I got a scholarship. Yeah. The state has constantly cut the support. Exactly. The UC system used to get, actually, no, not the UC system, the Cal State system used to get 47 or 48 percent of their, uh, you know, money from the state, the rest of the tuition and everything else. Now it's in the, in the high 20s. Yeah. So what I think the federal government needs to do is set up a program with some rules. And the rules would be, you know, the state has to contribute a certain amount, whatever, whatever percentage we pick, 35 or 38 percent. The, the university just can't increase their tuition faster than the rate of general inflation. Right. And maybe some other requirements that to control the situation. Right. And if you do that, then any student who applies right. and is accepted, the federal government pays the tuition. Right. That, that's what I would be in favor of. Okay. I understand the base. wish. You can simply say, we'll give you $2,000 if the tuition is uh, to the university of the state yeah. if you give the guy free, free tuition. Yeah. You could. Yeah, there's different ways to do it. That would right. motivate the states. Yep, you could do that one. Well, I understand the impulse not to allow universities, consciously or unconsciously, or just part of the logic of the situation, to say, well, students are getting more support, so we'll just raise tuition. Sure. I understand that. You kind of want the, that not to happen. Yeah. Sure. At the same time, I'm an old... I taught colleges for 40 years. Yeah. And I was very surprised to hear from Republicans this idea that there should be a cap on tuition, there should be controls on tuition. And even with Republicans, I would say, you know, I thought you were against price controls. Uh -huh. You know, what are you doing? You know, I, because you're a Republican. You know that price controls don't make sense. College costs may, in fact, go up faster than the general inflation rate. Right. So it's not really... You know, I've, I've, I'm really worried about any kind of uh, caps on tuition that, that are just arbitrarily imposed. I'm sorry, I'm myself. Arbitrary amount. No, 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 come in. That's okay. Don't with the mother. No, I think I think your point is legitimate, but I would put it as a you know, it's kind of like the way to do it in basketball. They have a salary cap, right? But it's a soft cap. Yeah. So I think you do have to have a rule that says generally you can't increase faster than tuition than, yeah. than inflation. But if you apply for a waiver, because you went out and you built a biological lab and you have to pay for that, so instead of two percent, you had to raise four percent, you have to apply for an exemption. I don't I don't what we're trying to avoid is what you would refer to. You want to give colleges carte blanche to just say, Oh, now it's easy, I'll just raise my tuition. Right. So that's what's but you do have to have a soft cap. You do have to have a, uh, flexibility to grant waivers. I don't think well, we've seen that in California. The legislature said, we'll give you more money. But the agreement right. is you don't raise tuition. And the university said, they, they play ball with that. They said, okay, you gave us the money, we won't raise tuition. Don't give us the money, and we'll have no choice but to raise tuition. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there could be a kind of contract, uh, right. yeah. implicit contract, that yeah. says, you know, you're not going to take advantage of this. I, I think that's yeah. the idea. Because otherwise, otherwise it would be just a continuation of the status quo at a higher level. Yeah. Yeah, I think I agree with that. But that sounds good to me. I like the, the public university part of it. You know, I think you have to do it. Public yeah. universities used to be oh. free. In California, well, we, have to, they if, were free. We, we believe, you know, we've always believed here for 100 years in this country yeah. that primary education should be taxpayer funded. Yeah. But we should recognize now that the amount of education you need to actually be a yes. productive citizen is more than what it was 100 years ago. 100 years ago, 8 or 10 years of, of schooling might have been enough for us to feel comfortable as a society. But it's not anymore. In order to be a well-informed citizen for voting and a productive citizen in the workforce, you need more than just eight or ten years of schooling. You need to have the rest of the schooling paid for. Yeah. It's just a simple recognition of the situation of the modern world. Yeah. And we're certainly a wealthy enough country to pay for it. And one of the things that Barry at our last meet and greet that I was at on Thursday, because it was my house, um, he, he brought up the point about not everybody really needs to go to college that there should be trade schools sure. for people to get into the non uh, the craftsman trades or whatever you want to call them yeah. Yeah. and those people need to be supported as well yes. so that they, yes. uh, you can't just make it a blanket just for the college people 
Oh, no, of course not. I mean, I was the specific yeah. question was about colleges, and I think right. that is a specific problem. But I don't think it's as big a problem as the other problem. Yeah. We started in the campaign months ago talking about the 60 or 65 percent of the students that don't go to college. Yeah. And that's really more why Trump was elected. He wasn't elected because of student debt. Yeah. He was elected partly because of this section of the population that feels disadvantaged because either they or their children yeah. don't have the economic opportunities that older generations have. And that is a function of not having enough schooling opportunities for skill-based education, right. where again, the federal government has to play the role, and it's like three or four steps we talked about at your house. First of all, you have to allow the private industry, the private sector, to say these are the jobs that are being created that are highly paid, right. skilled jobs that don't require college. And we know already that there's hundreds of thousands of them in uh, green energy, hundreds of thousands of them in medical technology, and hundreds of thousands in automation. Yes. So once they define the job, you already have vocational schools and two-year colleges and labor unions that have designed curricula that will enable students to go through this kind of skill-based apprenticeship programs. And all you need after that is a funding mechanism, which should be the federal government in conjunction with local and state governments. It should be a matching plan. So now the jobs are defined, the curricula is developed over here, the federal government provides the uh, impetus. And if it works properly, you'll end up with a system that'll be a mixture of good features, including what happened in Germany, where very often in Germany, Siemens or Volkswagen ends up paying the tuition mm -hmm. in order for that student to immediately have a job. As soon as they graduate, they go right to work for Siemens. Right. So I think that's more important than the problem with college, because the, at least the college students, even though they have the debt, they have a good job opportunity. Mm -hmm. We know that college is still a good investment if you can get through, and even if you can get the debt, You'll pay it off, hopefully. Right. So I think we have to fix that problem. But the problem of the non-college student is a greater problem. First of all, it's more people. And we pay a much bigger price when people don't have enough. That's what that's the price we're paying. You have children and you're, you're a coal miner, you're laid off. You don't have a retraining opportunity. Your student isn't going to go to college and there's nothing out there. You get bitter, you get depressed, and you become a Trump voter. You become a Trump yeah. voter. We have to, I mean, it, it, it's all about economic opportunity. Yeah. And we have definitely fallen behind. And this is a case where Democrats deserve some of the blame. This is not a one-sided situation. The Democrats embraced automation and globalization, which I also embrace. But when you embrace those forces, you have to prepare for the disruptive side of those forces. Right. In the aggregate, they produce prosperity. In the aggregate, it's good for the economy. But it's not only about the aggregate. It's also about the pockets of people who are displaced. And we ignored those people, and we ignored it, and we're paying a big price for it now. Part of it that strikes me is when you're young, you can be mobile. It's easy to move around because you're still establishing a family and a home, and so it's easy. But when someone's got roots in a community, building cars or mining coal or whatever, or building refrigerators in Iowa, and uh, the plant closes up and goes away, and someone's lived there 20, 30 years, wow, and you got to move to a solar plant the next date over? That's a big challenge for most people, mm -hmm. and that is an issue that needs to be addressed. Mm -hmm. it, it does, and a lot of people overlook the fact that one of the, again, contributing factors to where we are today, people don't realize the connection between the financial crisis which caused a lot of people to have houses that are underwater mm. and the Trump phenomenon. Because even now, seven, eight, ten years later, there are many people who actually would move, but they can't. Mm. So even those families that want to move can't move because the house is underwater. And as a matter of fact, statistically, the mobility of American workers is the lowest it's been in generations. Mm. And it's partly because they're tied down to a mortgage that is still underwater and they can't really say, you know what, I'm going to sell this house and move because nobody wants to buy the house. Right. You know, they'll take a big loss if they do. So it is, but we do have to recreate the mobility of the workforce because the jobs are not always going to be where you want them to be. So you have to try to create jobs where people are, and usually you can do that, but you also need to increase mobility, make mobility possible. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that, that has to do, again, here's, the, here's where, here's where, um, where so many issues intersect. This is why Medicare for All is so important. Mm -hmm. Some people can't leave because yes. they may have a low-paying job, but at least they have some health care. Yeah. So now if they pick up a move, they have no health care. Yeah. So Medicare for All also impacts on the mobility of people to take new yeah. jobs, 
So, so you know, the, these issues, we, we have a tendency to look at issues in the isolation and say, right. here's how we're going to attack this right. problem. But we forget the problems are usually interrelated. If we start with Medicare for all, we'll have a positive impact on dozens of other problems that we don't see the direct relationship, but the relationship is there. That's true. I don't understand why businesses don't strongly support Medicare for all. I mean, they know that health care for a business is an enormous problem and an enormous burden and really holds them down. And if that were taken care of some other way and they didn't have to think about it, it would release a lot of energy just in the businesses. So that's why those three business leaders said, we're going to uh, get out of the health mess we're in and we're going to do it our own way. Yeah. And I don't know what's happened with that, but that has been a big thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, corporations understand that the, the crisis is hurting them. It hurts them. I mean, and they're, they're trying to address it. Afternoon. Yeah. All right. Can you sit down? Sit down. Exactly. Um, my question is, uh, teachers, um, I think your main career was in insurance, but I was, I'm a teacher, I was curious to know more about uh, I was a teacher. teacher, I was an English teacher, high school English teacher. What, what do you teach? Uh, physics and chemistry, okay. El Dorado High School. Uh, I was a high school English teacher, and um, it was a while back, but I was kind of surprised, well, not a surprise really, as, uh, you know, other things in life, but the problems haven't really changed that much in all the years since I taught. The biggest difference I found in teaching problems today is that it's more bureaucratic than it was when I taught. Right. That's about the biggest problem. More, more paperwork than ever. Yeah. More lesson plans, more stuff you have to report on. But in terms of class size and supplies and modern supplies and your computers and internet, which wasn't a problem for us, it was just supplies. We never had enough, you know, we never had enough uh, slide rules. Uh, or whatever it might have been. So I don't think the problems in education have changed much. I really don't. That's, that's the problem. The teachers are still way underpaid. When I was teaching, you know, the most I ever made as a teacher was four thousand, about forty-one hundred dollars a year. So you know, you can adjust it for inflation and everything else. It's still not a lot of money. Um, and I think I think we need to really refocus on the fact that we have to treat teachers better. We have to get classes under control. I mean, we have to fund education much more fully. We can't allow the schools to continue. You know, you can't allow schools to continue to decline. Since you mentioned right to work laws, I would mention uh, something I alluded to before. I think one of the key points in general, and particularly in this election, is this issue of vocabulary. Because for, for many decades now, 
the conservatives and the Republicans have learned to dominate the vocabulary for most issues. Mm -hmm. So if you think about right to work, it's not, it has nothing to do with working, right? It's just about should I pay dues or not? It's a discussion about should a, a non-union member pay a fee for the services he gets from the union? Now that's a totally legitimate discussion. But should it be 70 percent? Fair share or eight? no fair share? Yeah, but it, but it has nothing to do with yeah. working. It has nothing to yeah. do with working. Right. And so they gain a lot of traction by saying right to work. Yeah. We're a right to work state. And which, of course, yeah, I'm in favor of right to work, aren't you? Yeah. And they do the same thing with abortion, right? It's right to life. It's others, but it happens to be that the, the slopes are almost identical. Yeah. Union membership goes down, purchasing power to the real class goes down. We have to get back to understand that collective bargaining is part of uh, what we need in this country. It's very difficult for any employees to sit at the table across from employees and have equal, equal weight, equal power. It's impossible. And so collective bargaining is, is an effort to even up the score a little bit. And even at its best, it rarely has equal weight, if ever, to an employer. So the employer has all the apparatus of the state, the lawyers and the laws on its side. And all the union really has on its side is its membership and its ability to uh, use whatever tools are available to it, which may may include a strike at the end of the day. Uh, but it's not it's not an equal it's not an equal battle. Yeah. And without unions, it becomes uh, you know, not a battle at all. So I'm a big believer in the unions. I big believe we're trying to resurrect the union movement in some fashion. I have a union background. Uh, American Federation of Teachers. I was an AFT. Um, Officer of the AFT. Did you teach in Orange County or in, in New Jersey? Okay. I taught in New Jersey. Right, I went to public high school in New York State. New, okay. All right. 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 You, know, you know the AFT? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. So I was um, in Newark, New Jersey. Uh, when Al Shanker was right there. And, um, you know, we, uh, we went out on strike uh, to get a better contract for teachers. And um, it was somewhat of a long strike for its day. It was over a three and a half week strike for teachers. It was the longest teacher strike in the U.S. up to that point. Mm -hmm. And as a result of the strike, we did have a, a great collective bargaining victory. We had um, we got much higher wages and smaller class size and much better benefits. And we actually negotiated the first grievance procedure uh, in history of, that, of, of Essex County, New Jersey. But as a result of the strike, because the school board was able to get a judge to issue an injunction against the strike, claiming it's an illegal strike. New Jersey does not have an explicit prohibition on public employee strikes, but the judge said it was against public safety. And so as a result, the union leaders went to jail, um, and I, I served a 30-day sentence in jail mm. for participating in that strike. Wow. So, um, you know, when I say that I believe in, uh, in unions and I'm gonna fight for unions, I'm, I'm gonna fight for unions. And as I've always said, I'm not, not necessarily planning to go back to jail, <laughs> and revisit that particular experience, <laughs> but um, I have, but I have, I believe in getting in there and fight for it. I mean, we got to fight for it. I mean, um, as you said, unions were something people forget that to get collective bargaining legalized, hundreds of people were killed. Yes. I mean, there, were, there, were, there were deaths. Yeah. It isn't like everybody went out and said, "Can we have collective bargaining?" And they elected Congress and said, "Yes, you can have a collective bargaining law." People went and rioted. There were there were police deployed on the other side. Mm. Um, most people back, and by the way, in this country don't know, but this is for Sarah's benefit. You know the Pinkerton, I don't know if you know the Pinkerton Company. Yes. They actually originally were formed as an anti-union organization. That was their whole purpose. Yes. You may, may know that. That was their whole purpose. They were formed to be strike breakers, to beat up the strikers, and companies would hire them when there was a strike and send out the Pinkerton agents to, uh, to break the strike. And uh, they were, obviously, they've been fairly successful in uh, breaking strikes in the other way, not necessarily by beating them up anymore, but legally mm. beating them down. Yeah. Propaganda. So uh, uh, I'll do everything I can to uh, overturn right to yeah. right to it. Can I change the subject just a little? Sure. Recently, our I hesitate to use the word our the Republican Congress and passed a tax bill that had rather far-reaching effects, including increasing our deficit significantly, giving getting our corporate tax rate probably aligned okay with other countries, but how would, uh, it was basically a ripoff for uh, middle America, so how would you alter or reform that law? Well, I would try to roll it back completely. I mean, there's one or two features of it might be okay, but by and large it's a ripoff. I'm sure most of you know the numbers as well as I do, but just for the record, uh, for every $3 of tax cut in the bill, Percent of the population, one percent of the working family. 
Chinese middle class family, so it should be overturned. But I also want to point out, it was based on a myth. There's a myth going around, the Republicans started it, that America has the highest corporate tax rate in the developed world before this bill was passed. Totally untrue. It's total myth. We do have the highest nominal corporate tax rate in the developed world, but nobody pays it. Nobody ever paid that 35% that <laughs> corporate rate. You could find a few service companies that paid a high rate. So if you wanted to fix that, you could have passed a targeted law with a small number of companies that did pay that high rate. Oil companies in this country pay about 8 or 10%. They don't pay 35%. That was before the tax bill. General Electric, I happen to have a lot of knowledge about General Electric because they're the largest stockholder. Uh, General, General Electric Pension Fund is a large stockholder in my company. They have literally hundreds of tax lawyers and accountants that work for them with the sole purpose of finding ways to reduce their taxes. They pay 6 or 8% on this gigantic hundreds of billions of dollars in revenue, billions of dollars in profit. They pay 8 or 10% in taxes before the tax bill was passed. So the Republicans, again, took the vocabulary, they took the myth of the high posted nominal rate and say we have the highest rate in the world. We've never had a particularly high rate of taxes that corporations actually pay. And now they lowered it even further. It was a total scam. My pet peeve, my pet peeve in that tax bill, and you know, is estate tax. It's the estate tax. And even though it's not that significant financially as a um, symbol of the ultimate in greed, the ultimate in taking money from, you know, from the poor and giving it to the rich, taking money from the middle class and giving it to the rich, in, the, in 2000, the estate tax exemption was $1 million. So a couple could leave a million dollars to whoever they wanted to, and there was no taxes. The couple wasn't taxed at the time of death, and the recipients are not taxed. In 18 years, the Republicans have raised it to $22 million. In this new tax bill, they raised it, it was $11 million, and they doubled it. It's now $22 million. So a wealthy family can leave $22 million tax-free. There's no reason for it. And yet they get a lot of mileage out of uh, on their radio and stuff talking about the death tax exactly. and all because well, it, lights, doesn't, you know, yeah. it doesn't hit 99.5% of the doesn't population, only the wealthiest who when uh, it was, could uh, afford to share a little bit more with uh, Before they the doubled it, when it was 11 million, something like I think it was 1,800 families actually paid a state tax in this country. Everybody else paid nothing. That's how small a segment is being benefited benefiting from, from this crazy estate tax exemption. It's completely nuts, there's no primer for it, and they used to use the myth, it's a good example of vocabulary, they call it the death tax, like they're taxing death. What they're really taxing is the accumulation of wealth, which in most cases has never been taxed. Because what do most major estates consist of? If Warren Buffett passes away tomorrow, what does his estate consist of? His stock in Berkshire Hathaway, which has never been taxed. It's an untaxed capital gain. He dies, goes to his heirs, they get untaxed. On top of that, his heirs mark it up. You know, if I leave you stock and I pay $2 for the stock, and I die and the stock's at $1,000 and I leave you that stock, you mark up your cost basis to $1,000. So you don't pay taxes when I give it to you, and then your cost basis is $1,000. You don't have to, nobody pays anything on that gain from $2 to $100. So the whole estate tax area is one that symbolizes how the Republicans are only interested in the top segment of the population. Whatever they may say, whatever the category is, how good they are at spinning things and propaganda, the Trump administration has had great virtue stripping away this respectable veneer and say, look, the truth is, we don't really care about you. We're going to insult you. Oh, you're an immigrant? You're a woman? Muslim? We're going to insult you. We don't care about you. We really don't care. At the end of the day, what we care about is people who, you know, wealthy people, real estate developers, this, this pass-through this pass through element of the, of the tax bill is crazy. It's crazy. So you have, you have pass-through income, passive income, which is real estate investments. You get a big 20% break on your taxes. Yeah, that's was new and I hadn't heard that at all back in December but uh, when my wife and I finished our taxes and she she's the main one that does taxes I was curious about how it's getting what's going to happen in 18 uh, because we itemized taxes my wife was saying we're going to get a six thousand dollar higher tax bill um, because the itemized deductions are being reduced including the one uh, the the miscellaneous deductions which includes uh, union wages it's gone completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or on, 
and I went to Lasser's website, and they have this long 80-page thing about how it's going to be different, but they're, they're really, the meat of it is, is like five pages. And on the very same page where Lasser's describes the miscellaneous deductions going away, there's a brand new deduction for people who own S corporations and LLCs. Right. Do I know people who own S corporations <laughs> and LLCs? Right. No, but the people who can afford tax lawyers are going to, yeah, and as you said, it's like a 20% off. 20% uh, for people 20% who, your income who make their is money tax. that way. 20% of your income is tax free. Yeah. And what, it, it's a bad idea to begin with, but what really makes it bad is it creates an unequal playing field because there will be some people who go to their employer and say, really? instead of calling me an employee, sign a contract with me, and then I'll call it passive income and I'll somehow get a 20% tax rate. So it's, it's, it's a terrible idea. It's only to benefit Trump and other real estate investors. It has no economic purpose at all. And, and I never heard anything about that in December, or November, yeah, November yeah. when they were talking about this. It is, a, it is, a, it is a scam. Well, part of it is like yeah, the, the, the little I, I, I look at the tax impact. Uh, like uh, Andy said, it's only the top group because they have actually reduced the whole two percent. Everyone else, if you look at that. You actually increase no matter that you increase one or two percent. But as you point out, by eliminating the deduction, that really affects yeah. you, right? If you go back, ask your wife, it's the last five years. It's a way of hitting California, New York, and other states that Right. If you go back to the last one, ask your wife, go back to the last five years, how much federal tax in terms of percentage you actually pay? Yeah. Not not the top rank, okay? It's just after all the deduction, I'm going to. You may pay anywhere from 11 to 13 percent, okay? Because even in 2000, if you remember that guy called Steve Forbes, he proposed a 17 percent flat tax. No itemization, no deduction, nothing but 17 percent. He was voted down because most people, the net is less than 17 percent. And still the, the, the same thing. Uh, yeah. But once these deductions are removed, everyone will pay more than 17%. So don't forget also that the tax bill, when you stuck into the tax bill, repeal the mandate on healthcare. Right. Yeah. Well, so now what happens is the few people who might actually end up paying less in taxes, their insurance premium is going to go up because without the individual mandate, they're not paying as much in taxes. Right. So that's the problem. Yeah. 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 Premiums go up because the pool is not as healthy, and so that's why we see some of the Affordable Care Act exchanges rates going up 20 percent because they would do the mandate as well. So that tax bill had all kinds of stuff crammed into it 20 percent, you know, tax free for pass through state tax, which is nuts, uh, the repeal of the individual mandate. It was just a grab bag of stuff, almost all of which helps the wealthy, and very little of it helps anybody else. Very old fashioned Republican. Exactly. And basically, and got all these middle class and lower middle class, particularly whites, who think it's going to help them. Yeah, and, right. and, and basically, propaganda. Yeah. Well, well, what they want Ra this. Ryan and the Republicans want is to hold power, and when the chicken comes home to roost with the big deficits, they want to use that as an excuse to go after Medicare and Social Security. Right. 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 Exactly right. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So now, this another subject I want to bring up is the fake news and the truth. I think how how could we have something to say the government has to tell? The truth has to be fact-based, and so do news organizations. So that it's not just you change a word, to say I'm this is a commentary, this is not news, and then you get away from it. So, because a lot of the people don't have as much education background don't have that much time to do research to find out which is true which is not true and all these fake news are out there no one even knows which is fake which is not. I, I think that is something congress should do something really quick so that we get our integrity back we the whole world is loving us we don't know what you guys are talking about we don't know which is true your president is not telling the truth your congress is not telling the truth what are you guys doing over here? Part of it is our libel laws. There's a, a reverse of England. England, if someone is sued for lying, the person who said the lie has to prove that it was a lie or, or the truth. But in America, 
the person doing the suing has to provide the proof. So it is much harder to have a suit in the United States because the accuser has to prove the lie, but in England, there, the accused has to prove what he said is well, true. On top of that, though, in the English law is actually a little worse than that. In fact, there's another difference that's even worse. In the United States, the rule of libel is that um, if it's true, you can't sue me. It doesn't matter. If, if I say something about you that's horrible and it destroys your reputation and costs you $10 million, if what I said was true, that's the ultimate defense in the United States. It's true. It doesn't matter. Can't, England, the law is the opposite. If I say something and they can prove that my purpose was to damage you, even if what I said was true, you can be sued for libel. So in England, the real problem is the truth is not a defense against libel in England. So if I get into a big public battle with you, and I say, and let me tell you about his background, and he got this, and it turned, and, it, and he, and because of, he actually suffers, all they have to do is go to court and say, my purpose was to damage you, and then I'll be found guilty of libel. So the English libel laws are very difficult, very difficult. They wouldn't fit in the United States at all. They actually make no sense. The United States, we still have the idea of libel, even against Trump's opinion, in the United States, for libel law only, truth is the ultimate defense. If you're telling the truth and you can prove it's true, it doesn't matter what the consequences were. And even if you did it maliciously, if it's true, it, you can't be sued. You, you will not be found guilty of libel. In the UK, it's the opposite. Even if it's true, but you did it maliciously, you could be found guilty of libel. But our problem with fake news is much greater than libel. We do have a problem. I don't, I don't know what the answer is. I mean, it is a deep, fundamental problem that people hear stuff that is totally crazy, that they, they, they're, they're victims to ridiculous conspiracy theories. Sometimes it's just, just the level of Fox News. Sometimes it's the level even deeper than that. You all remember the incident where uh, a crazy right-winger showed up at the pizza place in Washington, Pizzagate? New York. Uh, Washington, in Washington, yeah. in, in Washington Maryland, DC. I thought. Whatever. Wherever. Somewhere yeah. back east. <laughs> back east. Well, I actually was there recently. They showed me the pizza place in DC. Oh, okay. <laughs> I went by the place. So, so it's, pizza, it's called Pizza Game. Because somebody on these crazy right wing blogs said that Hillary Clinton is running a sex slave circle out of a pizza joint in DC. And somebody showed up with a gun to self investigate. I don't know how you fix that problem. I mean, that's just incredible that anybody would even believe it. It's kind of hard to stop people from saying it because of the First Amendment, so I don't think you can blame the well, the person or, who spreads the, it. The origin of our current fake news goes back to 1986, mm -hmm. when the equal time provision was taken out by the FCC, mm -hmm. that at that point, any public station, if they had any kind of opinion, had to provide time for the contrary opinion. When that was dropped, then people could just go hog wild. Really? That was in 86? Yeah. yeah. That's when it happened. But that only applied to public officials. Uh, no, mean, public stations. Pub no, but a public state, a public, no, but let's say Fox News. Even under the old rule, Fox News could say whatever they want to. Yeah, but then they had to, no, if no, someone, if, and, if so, and if someone said, yeah. that's an opinion and I disagree with it, then Fox yeah. had to give them time to counter their uh, their that, point. That's only if it was a public speaker. A Fox newscaster could say whatever he wants to. That, that rule applied to if they brought on a senator and the senator made a, con a conservative viewpoint, they'd have to bring on a liberal senator. But if the Fox News commentator yeah. said whatever he wanted to, then you didn't have to balance that. Yeah. Balanced law only applied for public figures, political figures. But the station itself could say whatever they wanted to. But it has changed hugely in, oh, it has in changed. my life. Has I, no, I mean, there's no doubt Fox, Fox News yeah. has changed the landscape. I, yeah. I still remember yeah. Walter Cronkite. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, right, right. I, he doesn't seem to be around uh, No, anymore. Walter Cronkite That's is running over bad. his grave. He's turning over his grave. He really is. Well, I'm going to have to go, but uh, I really enjoy this. And the good news is that I think there's going to be a change. It's still, Trump is still going to be president. And that's going to be very bad. And there's going to be a limitation of what even a Democratic Congress, even if you took both houses of Congress, there's still a limitation of what you can there do. Is. But you can try you can and try. you can stop the craziness. And so we yeah. need to have a Democrat in that. And we need to have a Democrat with the right values. Right. We do. We so, do. And but also bear this in mind, I've said this many times. Yeah. It's certainly true that a Democratic Congress and even a Democratic Senate, you still have Trump or Pence, as the case may be, as president. But this is where Trump might be a better president than Pence. Trump doesn't really believe anything. He cares right. about nothing. 
Well, he cares about one thing himself. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You are correct. He cares about his ways with the wind. But he cares about himself. So if, we, if, you, yes. if, the, if the Democratic Congress Takes passes something, well, and the true. Senate passes it, he might say, fine with me, as long as you let me hide the spotlight, yeah. as long as you let me continue with the circus, I'm fine. You see, really, you just don't, first of all, he probably is in favor of some gun control laws. He used to be in he favor. So. He used he to be in so. favor of reproductive rights. Who knows what he really believes? Yeah. So it will be difficult, and I'm not predicting Trump is going to turn out to be some, you know, sane, normal, rational person by any stretch of your imagination. No chance. And, and actually, I'm counting on the fact that he's not sane. <laughs> that he might actually say, "I'm going to go with." The I've already decided my point of view on that. I'm not interested in listening. That, to you. Exactly. That's exactly right. That's right. You know, Pence would be more difficult in that respect because Pence actually has beliefs that we disagree with. But he believes it. Confirmed. Trump doesn't believe in anything that I can tell. Well, well, well Trump has another concern. It has two names. One is Cohen and the other is Mueller. That's true. <laughs> that is true, Trump. And that is true, they're Trump. They're going to be a millstone around his neck. And somehow they could be used as leverage. Yep, yeah. yep. And all those things are true. So, But I think the main point yeah. is we can't predict the future. Right. Let's take back the House. That, Hopefully that the would Senate be a do, huge step forward. Do the best we can. Huge step forward. Take a step. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, thanks for coming. Thank you for your thoughts. Thank I really appreciate it. Oh, thanks for coming. Have a good one.